Hey, it's Greg Sestero from The Room, and you are listening to Cinema Psycho Show. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. Welcome to The Cinema Psycho Show. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. <laughs> oh, my God, don't stop now. With your hosts, Brian, John, and Elaine. <laughs> Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Connington, not joined by my fellow co-host, John Lane Wilscroft. Uh, this is another one of our bonus episodes, uh, this time with a hell of an interview. Got to be honest with you. So uh, a couple weeks back, we did a review of the 1989 film Elves. And while we were uh, discussing the film, I just looked on Google and was kind of curious about where some of the actors and actresses from the film are now. Uh, turns out that uh, Grizzly Adams had passed away, as well as the uh, mom character uh, from the film. She had passed away a couple months ago, actually, unfortunately. Um, however, the lead of the film, uh, an actress by the name of Julie Austin, uh, has uh, transitioned to another form of work, that is equally amazing as her performance in the movie Elves. So uh, we looked on all, of all, all places, LinkedIn and Google, and found that she is now a uh, this long laundry list of, of accolades. She is an inventor. She is also a public speaker. Um, she is the CEO of a, a company called Creative Innovation, and she is – spoken as a keynote speaker on innovation at a number of high profile uh, companies and is the inventor, as I said, inventor of a wrist water bottle called Swiggies. Now, the thing is, is we were just kind of curious, you know, would we be able to get an interview with Julie? Because we figured she would not want to be associated at all with talking about elves and talk about her experience with one of arguably the one of the worst films that we've ever seen. Um, surprisingly, John of all people went out and just contacted her and said, Hey, we're interested in talking to you about elves. And she was all for it. Uh, and what follows, uh, is a really awesome interview that goes over, uh, Julie's initial uh, steps in, in Hollywood, uh, and her involvement with the movie elves, kind of some behind the scenes things, <laughs> Uh, as well as where she's gone now and and where her uh, career has taken her. Um, just want to make a point of mentioning that Julie does have a brand new book uh, called From King's Court to Kickstarter uh, that I would just definitely suggest taking a read at. It basically looks at the idea of patronage uh, in, in Renaissance times and how that can be used nowadays uh, in the digital realm uh, to help artists. Uh, she actually has a website built around this concept called Indie Sponsor that I would highly suggest take a look at. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to throw it all to John and Julie Austin. Do you like the solar system? Yeah, it's quite cool, planets and stuff. All right, thank you for joining us here on a Cinema Psycho Show uh, bonus episode. We, uh, well, I should I say we, this time it's just myself here. Um uh, having the uh, enjoyment of speaking with Julie Austin uh, from uh, the movie Elves, that uh, the episode that we just dropped here. And uh, Julie, thank you very much for uh, taking some time out to talk with me. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a kind of a little generic way to start off here. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I, <laughs> um, I started out as an actor, uh, obviously, um, that I did Elves, the movie, and um, from there went into inventing. I invented a product called Swiggies, their wrist water bottles, and became you know, a business person, a manufacturer, and um, then kind of segued back from that into entertaining again, I guess, um, as a speaker. And uh, that's basically what I'm doing right now is uh, working as a professional speaker. So I get to actually get to write, direct, produce, and star in all of my own, uh, you know, material. <laughs> so 
So it's the best of both worlds, pretty much. In, in yeah, yeah I, I think so, yeah. You don't have to wait. I don't have to wait for someone to give me a job, basically. I'm out there. I mean, it's very similar to acting in a way, but um, but I, I, I want to say it's not as much competition, but that's not really true. <laughs> There's a lot of competition. <laughs> uh, and how did you get into acting? I started very early um, doing theater and doing commercials when I was a teenager. And um, from there, you know, when I was 19, it just took, I think I had $200 in my pocket and went to New York City, didn't know anybody, <laughs> and had no idea where I was going to live. I didn't know anything. I just basically got off the plane and said, here I am. <laughs> and then uh, I know it sounds crazy, but um, went straight into a modeling agency. And the weird twist of thing, I mean, if I had gone into that agency and hadn't met the people that I met that day, I think I probably would have just given up and gone home. I don't know what I would have done. But in the waiting room were some people from North Carolina, which is where I was from. And we started talking and they said, well, where are you going to stay? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't think about the fact that I probably had enough money to maybe at the time, you know, buy a couple of nights at a hotel. <laughs> that was it. And so they said, well, come and live with us. And it ended up, they were living in the hood. <laughs> so, I, I went, oh, this is interesting. This is a gang neighborhood. And, I was so naive, I didn't know anything about it. And that's where um, that's where I lived for the next year until I moved into the city. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and so how did how did elves become a part of your life? Like, w when did uh, did you audition for that? Or did somebody send you a script? Or how, how did uh, how did you become a part of that? Well, elves was actually my part was already cast. And um, my manager at the time, um, they wanted Dan Haggerty. So <laughs> basically he said, well, if you want Dan, you have to take Julie. And so I think, I, I assume they had to fire the person that they'd already hired. And um, I did have to audition for it. So if I you know, wasn't good in the audition, they weren't going to hire me anyway. But um, so that's what happened. And the, the director was not happy about it. Uh, but it ended up that he later became my boyfriend. <laughs> so oh, really? He okay. said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he said, I, I hated you. <laughs> I had to recast my whole movie around you. And then I think what they, he actually had to recast the other two actors because um, I was playing several years younger <laughs> than I actually was. And so, um, yeah, so he had to really recast a lot of the movie for me. I'm glad they did. <laughs> <laughs> and they got, you know, and they got TV's Grizzly Adams out of it, you know? <laughs> okay, cool. Oh yeah. He was wonderful. He was fantastic. Yeah, he he seemed like a very nice man. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, characters are one thing, but like you can kind of get a sense that he seemed like a like a very like genuine and like sweet individual. Oh yeah, and you know, there was one day uh, when we were shooting where the continuity was completely off, and they said, "Oh boy, we are going to have to reshoot the entire day," <laughs> and so I had to go and wake him up on his day off when he was sleeping late and I said, Dan, we got to reshoot this. I'm sorry you don't get a day off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was really, really cool about it. Gotcha. So that actually uh, leads into my next thing here. What was it like shooting the film? Um, and uh, what time of year did you guys shoot it considering? Um, well, uh, interestingly, it came out in October. I assumed that it had come out in December. Um, but what time of year were you guys shooting? Um, and what was it like, um, you know, shooting the film? Like, uh, was this w not to pile on the questions here, but was this your first feature length film that you had done or? Uh, no, I had done a few before that. And um, we, we shot it actually in the summer 
<clears throat> in Colorado Springs. And so we literally kind of turned the downtown into, uh, you know, a Christmas, uh, Christmas town. And um, we shot in one department store, mostly um, downtown. And so we just basically turned the whole thing into a, into a Christmas um, setting. But it was warm. <laughs> it was warm out. Gotcha. Uh, and was there like any added pressure to being the lead in the film, um, or is it just a just another acting gig, so to speak? I never even thought about it, but <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, it was what was really interesting is that the the people I, I was in town one one day and someone said, um, "Hey, can I have your autograph?" And, and I think it's the first time I've ever been asked that. Even though I've done, I had done a lot of movies and TV shows, uh, that was the first time that I'd ever been shooting something and someone came up and said, hey, can I have your autograph? And I thought, wow, that's, um, I, I don't know if I like that or not. I guess <laughs> it's just kind of weird. <laughs> Um, so obviously this is kind of like, uh, an extremely out there premise, especially for a, a Christmas film. Um, what did you think <laughs> while reading the script or while shooting? Like, um, how did that, um, how did you feel like, uh, that it's a Christmas movie, but about, you know, Nazi elves? You know what? I didn't think too much about it because I went, you know what? I'm getting paid a lot of money <laughs> and, um, it's fun and, you know, I, I, I didn't really... I didn't analyze the script. I guess if I went back and did, <laughs> I would think this is pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and um, what's it like, you know, being in a cult film and, you know, having that, like, that's something that, you know, a lot of people have taken a look at and, you know, have that kind of um, fame for being, you know, in a, in a cult film like that. Well, it definitely is a, a cult film. Um, after it came out, I did a, uh, it was the, I'm trying to remember if it was a, I think it was a Christmas pageant. It was like a um, parade, it's Christmas parade in Los Angeles. And I remember coming around the corner and everyone going, oh, Kirsten, it's Kirsten. And, <laughs> and the, the movie did really well in Japan. So I would get a lot of fans from Japan. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and, and still to this day, we'll have people send me emails and say, we watch this movie every Christmas. So it's the great thing about being in a Christmas movie <laughs> is that it comes around every year. Yeah, I don't know if I'm just a, a strange individual myself, but I... I... Uh, but at least every other Christmas I watch it. I originally got it on VHS because I couldn't find a DVD. And then I was excited when they finally, the DVD of it came out. So, um, it's, a uh, <laughs> it's a big hit in my house. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. I think I have heard, um, quite a few people say that they watch it every Christmas. So, so you know, so no, nothing wrong with that, but, <laughs> but it's a, a nice tradition, <laughs> even a weird one. <laughs> And how did this film, um, how did this compare, like, the process of working on this film as compared to the, some of the other, like, you know, Twisted Justice, Mood Talker, Super Force, some of the other films that you were doing around that time? Oh, it's way different than uh, Twisted Justice. Uh, Twisted Justice was, you know, we kind of were crammed in to, to shoot in a certain amount of time, and that one was shot actually that one was shot at christmas in fact they worked this until christmas eve <laughs> on that on that shoot and very different um it was uh it was shot in la the, the other one um else was shot in colorado and it was just a more laid back kind of atmosphere and just very festive you know we shot also mostly night so we would shoot throughout the night and I would go grocery shopping at five o'clock in the morning um, and then sleep during the day. So, but it was, it was, it was uh, so much fun. Gotcha. Um, so uh, please tell us more about what you've been up to. I, I say lately, but you know, for the past couple of years, tell us more about um, 
yeah, kind of what you, you hit at at the top of the episode and just, um, um, yeah, uh, if you want, I know, um, that you maybe have something coming out soon. I'm trying being a little vague cause I know we, we've talked ahead of time. Um, but yeah, about your, um, uh, you know, about what you have going on now. Well, it does come full circle a little, I guess, um, because I have a book that just came out called From the King's Court to Kickstarter, Patronage in the Modern Era. And it's an art history book about patronage and sponsorship from the Renaissance through today. So it's all kinds of, you know, whether it's actors or writers, um, you know, any kind of artist. Um, I try to cover as many artists, types of art, you know, performing, literary, fine art as possible. And it's about how during the Renaissance, the reason that all of the artists were working was because the banks were loaning money to small businesses. The economy there was booming. And so they needed, they had competition among themselves. So they would hire someone like a juggler to stand in front of their shop or a, a painter to paint their, their shop or, you know, they would sponsor plays and things like that, have someone singing in front of their shop. And that really, this the idea intrigued me so much that, you know, we really haven't done that. I mean, I don't see that today in a big way. And so I'm kind of trying to be, you know, a one person, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to get this started again. And I have a site website called Indie Sponsor, and it's for artists who want small business sponsorship. So it's the modern day version of what the Renaissance, you know, the, the artists went through. And 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 before the uh, the before the Renaissance, um, you either if you're an artist of any kind, you either work for the church or the state. And if you didn't work for either one of them, you were pretty much, you know, a traveling vagabond actor, you know, working for your supper or whatever. It, 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 they really didn't make that much money and didn't have any fame to speak of. And they weren't entrepreneurial. They weren't that entrepreneurial until the Renaissance. So today we have so many options. I mean, we have the internet. We have, you know, web shows, um, cable, there, there are just so many ways that artists can make a living at what they do, and they don't have to hold their hand out anymore like we, we used to do, you know, please give me a job, and that's really what is exciting for me, is I, I get to create my own job, and and that's what I want to do for other artists. Uh, and can you tell us that the, the name of the book and the website uh, one more time? Yep. The name of the book is From the King's Court to Kickstarter, Patronage in the Modern Era. And you can find that on Amazon. And the website is called Indie Sponsor, IndieSponsor.com. Because that, that sounds very interesting. Like, I might actually just check that out <laughs> for the podcast <laughs> here. Who knows? You know, um, I might be looking into that myself. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um thank you here for for giving me your time um and being so cordial with that and and i'm not just saying this because i'm talking to you now uh, you would hear it if you heard the episode um we we all agree that you were the best part of the film um and you were really great in it so i uh, appreciate you taking some time to talk with me and um just one last question do you think if they ever made a sequel do you think your character would have given birth to that elf we actually talked about the sequel <laughs> And I don't think we got that far. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I think so. <laughs> that would definitely turn it into a horror film, would it? <laughs> well, maybe that maybe L's too will pop on your desk. Or <laughs> we'll, we'll, well, you know what? I just I just noticed somebody did. Uh, I don't know if it's a remake or, or what it was. Uh, L's horror movie. Um, so, I don't know if someone made a remake or not. <laughs> <laughs> I have to check into that. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, Julie, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time here. And, um, yeah, that was uh, Julie Austin of uh, the 1989 film Elves. And very, as you heard, listening a whole lot more. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for listening in. And, uh, Julie, thank you for your time. Thank you. 
That was an interview for, with uh, John and Julie Austin. Um, again, fantastic interview. I'm glad and, and happy that Julie was so open uh, and kind to talk with us about her experience with, as I said, a movie that, that really is terrible. Uh, check out our review of it if you haven't yet, but, I mean, it, it's definitely a movie that uh, really aficionados of terrible cinema will appreciate, but everyone else might not. Uh, be sure to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google Plus at Psycho Show. You can also find us on the Epicast Network at epicastnetwork.com. If you have a favorite movie or question you want to throw away, you can contact us at cinemasychoshow.com. Uh, make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and iTunes and catch a new episode available every Sunday.